Hi, my name's Dr. Brenda Gladstone. I'm on faculty at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and I'm an academic fellow at the Centre for Critical Qualitative Health Research. I'm going to describe a method for research called digital storytelling. I'll describe what a digital story is, and I'll show you a digital story from one of my studies to illustrate some key considerations when using this method, along with other, more traditional qualitative research methods. I'll talk about generating data using this method, what it means to tell a good story, and why that's important to think about before you begin. I'll also talk a bit about what happens after the story is finished, because digital stories are made to be shared, and so it's important to think about who the stories might be shared with and why. This phase has been described as the digital afterlife, because it refers to what's, what happens to stories when they circulate beyond the research setting. Okay, so to make a start, I address three questions to get us thinking about digital storytelling. What are digital stories? What is digital storytelling? And is or how is digital storytelling a research method? Digital stories are short audio-visual narratives, or more simply, they are really, really short stories in a video format, usually two to three minutes in length. Sometimes it's easiest to think of them like YouTube videos, when I show you a digital story, you can decide if that comparison is a good one. Digital stories combine first-person voiceover narration based on a script written by the participant with music, video clips, digital photographs, texts, and drawings, all sourced either from the storyteller's personal archive or produced during the study. Digital stories are typically developed over the course of several days. A three-day workshop is most common and participants learn how to tell a good story in digital format. And there are strategies or criteria and narrative standards for learning how to tell a good story. However, the emphasis in using this method for research should not only be on the story itself, but also on the telling. It is digital storytelling after all. And digital storytelling anticipates, as I said earlier, sharing digital stories with others. It anticipates an audience of some kind to whom the story is addressed and possibly shared. Digital storytelling originated as part of community development art initiatives in the 1990s to provide a voice for individuals mar marginalized by mainstream or institutionalized media, including, I might add, that of academic research. Today, digital storytelling is used quite a lot in health research, alongside other traditional qualitative and participatory research methods, like photo voice or drawing methods, it is part of a visual genre in the broader arena of arts-based health research. Digital storytelling is used in health promotion research and practice, public health and community-based participatory research, and in multidisciplinary fields such as psychiatry, disability studies, and social work, covering a range of physical, mental, and emotional health topics and perspectives. So what makes for a good digital story? According to Paletti, a successful story is a narrative that will satisfy, surprise, and engage the viewer. There are seven elements in digital storytelling that help to create an effective story, and the first step involves choosing a particular moment from a larger story, and this choice is the basis for the story content. This decision creates space for a resolution of some kind in response to a position or point of view that the storyteller takes in the story. This choice must be articulated through a strong story structure that engages an audience by learning how to say it best. The concept of voice in digital storytelling is both metaphoric and literal. There is a voiceover narration of the final story script, and we actually hear the storyteller speaking. And this helps to invest the story with emotion that can engage the listener by personalizing the story. Voicing the story is the means by which audiences identify with the storyteller and the story is made to resonate with the listener. Economy and pacing refers to how the multimedia story is managed through editing to create a particular effect. Economy references the narrative's potential to produce closure in a short amount of time by generating implicit meanings through symbolism and metaphor that link back to the storyteller's point of view. Pacing governs how stories are structured to allow the viewer to contemplate and potentially project themselves into the story. Now that we know something about the elements of a good story, how is the story actually made? 
The process involves a sequence of steps that you can read about in more depth in the book chapter on digital storytelling in my references. For example, the story circle is an important first step. Participants share their stories and receive feedback in a space that is meant to be comfortable and safe. Individual script writing comes next, using the seven story elements and creating a visual storyboard to accompany the text. Participants take photos, shoot video, or record audio segments to support the story content. For example, they might produce drawings in the workshop setting or bring visual material from home to edit into the digital story. The technical aspects of digital storytelling come into play as participants learn how to use computer software to design, edit, and assemble their stories. The workshop typically concludes with a celebratory screening of the digital stories with the group. These are Fia's drawings and they depict three generations of her family, her grandmother, her mother, and Fia herself. They all experience mental health difficulties and Fia sees herself as trying to manage the consequences of illness across generations, a significant finding of this study based on all the study data, and illustrated so well in Fia's story. The study design included 10 young people who worked together as a group, longitudinally over the course of the study, guided by adult facilitators to clarify study objectives and research questions, produce the digital stories, analyze study data, and provide feedback on project findings. The participants recommended knowledge translation strategies to reach and engage audiences they wish to reach. And participant observation and informal interviewing methods helped me to document project activities and participant engagement in the research process. I want to tell you a little bit about Fia to set the context for watching her story. Fia was 17 when I met her at the Children's Mental Health Agency where she came for help through the Kids Help phone line. She lived at home with her mom and her dad and her two older siblings. And according to Fia, her mother suffers from depression and anxiety. Fia told me when I first met her that she was drawn to this research because it involved the arts and because it would be an opportunity for her to tell a story, a story that no one had seemed interested in hearing before, including the many doctors and therapists she had encountered for her own mental health problems. In fact, her story was something she felt she had to keep secret. I'm crazy too, Nana. They're telling me I have bipolar disorder. They're saying I'm too skinny. I'm smoking and I can barely breathe anymore. Was my last relationship abuse my fault too? I tried to kill myself, Nana. Your perfect bambina isn't so perfect anymore. She can't take it. After my dad left, my family and I moved into my grandparents' house. Between my nana and my mom's control issues, life with them was unbearable. When I was 11, my mom moved us into my now stepdad's apartment. Without a goodbye, she told us that we'd never see our family again. She said things would change for us, but things got back quickly. We couldn't cook, touch anything, wear our own clothes, or even have friends over. One time on my way to a friend's house, I got a call from my mom saying she would kill herself if I didn't come back and had a knife to her throat. Five years later, I'm in a hospital. They tell me I was going to die if I continued like I was. They said I needed to gain weight. They said I was anorexic. There was open wounds on my arm. I was scared. My mom was crying. I cried too because I had become her. I was probably as young as seven when my mom first told me she was going to kill herself. I loved my mom, I really did, but the fear of losing her to depression seemed stronger. As a kid, I was confused. I couldn't tell who the enemy was. Was it my mom? Was it my family? Or was it mental illness? How could she threaten to give us up and leave us when I had nightmares she comforted me till I could sleep again? Her paranoia became my paranoia. I would have been easier if I could just hate her, but I couldn't. My first breath of fresh air after a month of treatment was enough of a reason to try again. My mom said that since I was brave enough to continue living, she wouldn't make it worthwhile. I picked myself back up again like I had doing it since birth. I found my spark that was gone for so long. With my nana, I see one step that her parents didn't take. With my mom, I saw another step that her parents didn't take. It's up to me not only to make a step, but to make a leap into a better life, not only for myself, but for those after me.
Now that you've watched a digital story, I want to ask you, did you notice that you did not see Fia or members of her family other than through the drawing she created to represent people in her video? This was an important ethical decision made early in the study before the stories were made. I wanted young people to tell stories they wanted to tell, but I was also mindful that they were being asked to tell stories that could identify people in ways they might later regret or that significant people in their lives would not have a chance to respond to the stories before they were finished. With advice from my study review board, I decided that participants could depict people, but only in ways that would not identify anyone. This demanded some creative thinking on everyone's part, for example, by choosing to draw people, as Fia did, or by shooting photographs from behind or as reflections in a pool of water. The only rule was no pixelating of faces, and no use of any strategy that might be stigmatizing, like blurring or marking out facial features with an X. Did you think about why you were able to watch Fia's story in an open access for format like this one? The simple answer is that you could watch her story because Fia formally consented to share her digital story in the widest possible way. Mindful that digital stories are made to be shared, it was important to consider how participants might feel after they completed their stories, which might be different from when they started the process. To address this, I used a two-stage consent process. Participants gave their initial consent to participate in the study and to make the digital stories. And once the stories were complete, they decided the extent to which they were willing to share their stories, the broadest possible choice being the internet. It was important to me to use other qualitative methods in this study, and by providing time for the group discussion about the stories, I wanted to understand not only how each participant thought about their own story, but also how they thought about one another's stories, what they had in common, what was unique to each of their stories. By designing the study this way, each participant was able to hold their story at arm's length, to see it differently, to see it critically. By designing the study this way, each participant was able to deepen their own and my understanding of this particular lived experience. And they had a space that allowed them to discuss their stories and debrief once they were completed. As I come to a close, I want to talk briefly about the digital afterlife, about what happens to stories once they're finished. Because the digital afterlife refers to the expectation that digital stories will be shared. It raises questions about how stories are listened to and understood as they circulate beyond the workshop setting. However, this aspect of the digital afterlife has received less attention compared to the emphasis placed on producing digital stories. The inclusion of analytic discussions as part of my study design opened up a space to think more concretely about this afterlife. For instance, I asked participants explicitly who they wanted to share their stories with and why and participants responded with clear and specific ideas about which audiences and messages they wanted to address and suggestions on how to influence others to help make important social change. The digital storytelling method, digital stories, and the digital afterlife raise lots of interesting questions, especially if you're planning to use this method for research, and I hope you do. I invite you to think further about the potential for digital storytelling in your work. You can read more about the method and how I address some of these questions in a book chapter on digital storytelling, which you'll find in the references. Thank you for listening to my take on using digital storytelling as a research method. I've come to the end of my story, but I wanted to leave Fia with the last word on this topic because, as she said, with characteristic enthusiasm when she'd finished her own story, there is a whole world in just one story.